you're working Even if I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even if I don't see it, you're working Even if I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working you ne never Come stop, on, sing it out Even if I don't see it
Come on, every hand lift in this place. Sing this one more time. Anybody thankful for what God just did at Fall Revival 2018? Come on. Oh, you can do better than that. Are you thankful for what God did in you, through you at Fall Revival? One lyric in that song just stuck out to me. Chains will break. I think chains did break this last weekend. Anybody got some broken chains they want to thank Jesus for? Line 18 was one of the best experiences I've ever had. It's been so refreshing. It was just really fun. Reggie Dabbs really, she really hit it off for this. It was real funny. I believe God's going to shake our lives and shake this place over these next hours. It's not where you grew up. It's not what happened in your past. It's not that night that you wish you could forget. That's yesterday. That's what the devil meant for you never to be a tag changer. But now you have a new name. Now you've been given a white stone. This is the place where you find out who you will be. The hope, the love, the joy that goes from you and other people. We are tag changers. Yesterday, the spirit just had, like, my legs are trembling the whole time. The biggest thing that I will always remember is when he said, true repentance isn't crying, but it's not going back to that sin. Like, I just love that, and I will yep. never forget that. I really appreciate ORU's dedication to being in tune with the Holy Spirit, and not just in tune with scripts, being in tune with what we plan out to do. I say the worship overall, like, especially today, um, it really hit. It felt like a breakthrough, for sure. I just really could tell that God's moving in the service and moving in the hearts of everyone there. I actually got baptized, so it was super special to just give it all to God again and be renewed. I just thought the baptisms were so powerful. It's always amazing to be a witness to someone taking that decision to step forward and be renewed in Christ. Just like 40 minutes ago, I was in the prayer tower and I was barely able to get the words out, God, I'm tired of this prison. And he says, why are you talking to me about it? You put yourself there. <laughs> he said, you are the very thing that stops me from using you. So today I'm free. Hey. I'm free to talk to you guys. Jesus is here tonight. Jesus has come to stop the devil from beating up on you. He's more powerful than this thing. He breaks its dominion over your mind. It's time for us to be that man, that woman that's sold out for Jesus Christ. No turning back, no turning back. That army that the hell shakes every time you wake up. Hell is freaking out right now. Doesn't know what to do. Cause somebody in O.R. Roberts University is about to decide, I'm all in. Well, lots goes on at ORU, and this week we have a group of guests with us called the Ministry Leaders Advisory Council. This is a select group of pastors, small group, that is helping us uh, understand and work on how ORU connects with the local church around the world. Uh, this is really a work group, and they've become a wonderful fellowship, and I want to introduce some of them to you very quickly today. So as I mention their name, if they would stand and remain standing, and then you'll give applause to everybody at the end of this. John Blanchard is here from the Rock Church in Virginia Beach. John Carter from Abundant Life in Syracuse, New York. Ed Crenshaw from Victory Church in Audubon, Pennsylvania. Paul Doherty from Victory Church across the street. Derek Fry from Connect Community Church in Ashland, Massachusetts. Brian Gibson from River City Church in my hometown, Owensboro, Kentucky. Casey Hennigan from Key Point Church in Bentonville, Arkansas. Ron Lewis from Kings Park International Church in Manhattan and Durham, North Carolina. James and Colleen Morocco, King's Cathedral and Chapels in Cahoot. Kahului, Maui, Hawaii. Michael Phillips from Kingdom Life Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Bill Shear from Guts Church here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Lee Scott from Lively Stone Church in St. Louis, Missouri. And Scott Wilson from the Oaks Fellowship, Red Oak, Texas. Would you give all of them a hand? Outstanding leaders, and we're honored to be serving with them. Now, today is a special treat. 
Scott Wilson, who is one of our ministry leader advisory council, is a full-time pastor of 25 years. He is the senior pastor of the Oaks Fellowship in Red Oak, Texas. Now ministering to 4,000 people each week, Scott helped his father, Dr. Tom Wilson, start one of the most innovative public school systems in the state of Texas. Life School currently educates 5,000 students in six locations in the Dallas area. Scott is the author of several books. His latest release is Spread the Fire, Spirit Baptism in Today's Culture. He's a loving husband, a proud father. Scott and his wife, Jenny, have three sons, Dylan, Hunter, and Dakota. They live in the Dallas area. Scott is a wonderful friend. He is the co-chair of the United States Empower 21 cabinet. He is also the newest member of the ORU Board of Trustees elected last week. Would you welcome to this pulpit, please, in an ORU fashion, Scott Wilson. All right. Good morning, everybody. You may be seated. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. I love this place. It was like my favorite place on the planet, and that's the truth. Dr. Wilson, happy birthday, man. That's wow. Cool. <laughs> hey, I love this place because it's filled with a lot of people who love God and want to do great things for the kingdom. And today I'm here to talk to you about that. Everybody here who feels a big kind of weight on your shoulders because you sense God's touch on your life and calling on your life and you're here because you want to grow and you want to learn. But there's also this high frustration and anxiety can be there sometimes like, when am I going to get my chance? And I felt that too. I'm like 21 years old and I'm saying, why won't anybody let me do anything? Frustrated and feeling like, man, am I ever going to be able to become who God wants me? And I've got a word for you today that I think is very encouraging for everybody in here who wants to do something great for the kingdom. God sent me to talk to you today. So let's pray and get our hearts ready. Put your hand over your heart if you'd like. God, we just pray. Speak to our hearts today. Help us to hear what you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I was growing up, let me just show you, here's how it was for me. I wanted to be great for Jesus. <laughs> that was kind of how the whole thing was. Is, I want to be great, but of course, for the things of God and for the things that would last. And my hero growing up was a guy by the name of John Maxwell. Now, I don't know if you guys know who John Maxwell is, but Maxwell has written, listen to this. He's the most prolific writer on leadership in the world in all history, over 30 million books sold on leadership. But this guy is a believer. He is a world changer. He leads people to the Lord in the Fortune 500 realms and uh, presidents and kings of nations. I mean, this guy's the real deal. Well, back when I was like 20 something years old, 23, 24 years old, my dad had some of these tapes that had leadership. Oh, oh I forgot. Tapes are little square things that used to play and you could, yeah, okay. So uh, we, I would listen to all these tapes and learn from him. Well, and I would go, dude, this guy's genius. Well, guess what? John Maxwell came to my city, to Dallas, and he was in a conference setting like this, huge stadium uh, or, or church auditorium, but it was like 3,500, 4,000 people there. No one's on the front row, but I sat right where you are right there, and he sat on a stool like this right here. No one else is on the front row, and I was there. I don't know where I had this thought, guys, but somehow I was convinced I don't know where it came from. I feel stupid even telling you looking back now, but I, was, I, knew, I knew something was gonna happen like a light was gonna shine down on me right there. And he would see me and he would say, you are the next, the disciple of my life. I have been looking for you, everyone. Come follow me. I don't, it was weird. It's like, why would I think that? But I, was, I really thought that was gonna happen. And if God wasn't gonna do it, I was gonna help him out. So I was on the front row sitting right in front of him and I had my notepad out like this and I was leaning forward. And every time he says something funny, I would go. <laughs> That's awesome. And every time he would say something amazing, I would be like Dr. Wilson for real, cause wow's my word too. I'd go, wow. When he got done talking, the very last thing he did, he had tears coming down his face. He was sitting there. It was like a real dramatic ending. And he's like sitting there, thank you, Jesus. And amen. God bless you. Thank you guys for coming. 
We'll see you next time like this. I'm sitting in the front row and I know this is a horrible time for me to go talk to him, but I know it's my only time because he's about to go out the side door and head to the airport. So right when he said, amen, I walked right up to him like this. Dr. Maxwell, my name is Scott Wilson. I youth pastor right down the road and I've read all your books and listened to every tape you've ever done. I believe God's got a calling in my life to do something like what you do when, you, when I grow up, but uh, do you have any advice? and my hand sticking out like this to shake his hand. He doesn't even look up, guys. He's like this. And he reaches up and pats me on the shoulder and he says, son, you don't even know what you're asking. And then he walked off the side and I'm left there standing going, what just happened? I went back to my house and I prayed and I said, God, what happened? Why didn't you tell him who I was? I know there's a calling on my life. Why didn't you tell him of who I am and who I will be? And I felt like the Lord told me this. How did you think that was going to work out? Like I'm going to delegate my responsibility of what I'm doing in your life to him? Then he said, I didn't call you to be the next John Maxwell. I called you to be the first Scott Wilson. So I began to just try to grow and study and just to settle in on that. But can I tell you, there's a lot of people wasting time trying to be somebody else, missing the opportunity to become the best they can be and who God's made them to be. When God is inviting every one of you right now to come into a trust relationship with him, that you really trust him more than just a Sunday school lesson or a biblical theological thought, but to really trust his timing, trust his process, trust his plan, trust that if he's given you a dream, he's got a way to get you there. And his way is a lot better and thorough in preparation of getting you ready than you're quick like, well, how can I make this happen? Hi, Dr. Maxwell. What does it look like, though, to trust God like that? You know what it looks like? Jesus. Do you know that Jesus didn't just come to the earth to die on the cross? He said, well, what did he come for? To model for us the kind of life we could have with the Father. In fact, Jesus prays before he goes to the cross, and he's praying for us, and he says, Lord, I pray that they would know that you love them the same way you love me. I want them to know that you want to talk to them in the same way you talk to me. I want them to know that you want to lead them just the same way you lead me. What does it look like to trust God in process? What does it look like to trust the Father in the vision and the calling on your life and to get there? It it looks like Jesus. Even in the bad times, man, Jesus trusted the Father. Think about the night before he's going to die and he's going to be arrested. Y'all know that he knew it was going to happen. How many of you be freaking right now if you knew tomorrow you're getting crucified? The rest of y'all are liars. He, I mean, come on. That's scary stuff. And yet he walks into the Last Supper with his disciples, and there's water, and there's a towel, but there's no servant in the room, and they're supposed to wash feet because it's hard to eat food when people's feet up in your face, and they didn't have chairs. They like laying out like this. And so they needed to wash feet. Nobody wanted to do it. And if I was Jesus, you know what he did is he got up and washed their feet. But if I was Jesus, I'd be going like, hey guys, I'm doing cross duty tomorrow. Somebody do feet duty tonight. (laughs) Wouldn't that make sense? But no, he goes over and he gets the towel. He washes their feet and he comes back to the front of the table. And this is what he says. I've done this as an example to you that you would love each other the same way I've loved you. What does that mean? That you would love each other even when they betray you. That's who was in the room. Love people and serve them even when you know they'll abandon you. Love and serve people even when they're not going to have your back. They're going to act like they don't even know who you are. How do you love like that? How do you live like that? If you want to love like Jesus, you got to think like Jesus. How was he thinking? Well, let's look in the Bible. In John chapter 13, verse five verses, it gives us the clue here of the three things that Jesus knew in order for him to live this way. Here's what it says. It says, it was just before the Passover festival and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew what? 
that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer garment and wrapped a towel around his waist and he washed their feet. What were the three things Jesus knew? Number one, he knew that the father was in control. He knew that God was in control. Number two, he knew that God had sent him. How many of you know that's a big deal? When you know you're going to get arrested, when you know you're going to be crucified, it doesn't sound like we're on schedule to do good things. And yet he knew the father was in control and he knew he was right where he was supposed to be. And the third thing is he knew that the father would empower him to fulfill his calling. Now, here's the question. Everybody look up here. Here's the question today. Do you know this? I mean, do you know God's in control? And I know that the the ORU chapel answer is, yeah, of course. Of course we know that. But do you know it in here? I mean, do you know it when you didn't get the job? Do you know it when nobody picks you? Do you know it when everybody else is abandoning you and you're depressed or you're frustrated and you feel like, where's my chance? I know there's a calling on my life. Do you know he's in control? Do you know that everything will work together for the good of those who love him? Which means it may not work out the way you want, but it ain't gonna work out the way he wants. Do you know that he's the one who sent you? And if you go when he sends you, he's going to back you up. So all you got to do is wake up in the morning and not think about where, who's, if I'm sending myself, do people know me? What door am I going into? And how am I going to make things? If I don't meet the right person, if I'm not in the right place, if instead of doing all that, you wake up and you say, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? This ain't my gig. It's yours. And if you send me, nobody can stop me. If I humble myself under your mighty hand, you will exalt me in due time. And whatever your plan is, it won't be thwarted. You will empower me to fulfill my calling. What if we trusted, come on, come on everybody, called men and women of God, what if you really trusted God? You wouldn't try to push and shove and make things happen. You'd wake up every day and just say, tell me what to do. Tell me what to say. Tell me where to go. I just want to stay in step with you. 10 years after I'm on the front row and I walk up, right after that, 10 years later, I get a phone call from a guy named Gerald Brooks. Gerald is on John Maxwell's board. He called me and he said, hey, John invited all the board members to bring one friend with them to spend two days with John Maxwell. There's like 10 board members. They could bring 10 people. That means there'd be 20 of us with John for two days. He said, would you like to go? I'll pay your hotel and pay your flight and everything. I said, hmm, let me see. Yep. (laughs) So I get there. I'm sitting by Gerald in John Maxwell's office with 20 people in the room. I'm one of 20. I'm sitting by Gerald. And there's only one seat open left. It's right next to me. John Maxwell walks in. Everybody stands up. He says, gentlemen, good to see you. How are you doing? Sits down right by me. And he says, guys, I know most of you. I don't know all of you. I think I was the only one who didn't know in the room. And he said, but you guys are powerful leaders. And you've got a lot of weight. And you've got a lot of pressure. You've got a lot of things you're going through. But everybody else just sees you and goes, man, if I had their church, man, if I had their job, man, if we had their resources, wow, if I could be like him, I just want to be like him. Everybody looks at you, but they don't know the pain. They don't know the cost. They don't know the weight you're covering. They don't know any of that. He says, I remember being in Dallas, Texas 10 years ago, and there's a kid on the front row and he's sitting there going, hey, Dr. Matt, you're so funny. (laughs) He comes up to me. I'd like to be with you and grow up. And I just look at him and I go, kid, you don't even know what you're asking. This is me sitting next to him. (laughs) He didn't know it was me. And I ain't dumb. I ain't telling him. (laughs) But I go back to my hotel and I said, God, he didn't know that was me. But you knew it was me. And I've become a John Maxwell illustration. (laughs) And you had him share it with me sitting right by him. What was that about? And I'm telling you, it doesn't happen all the time. But the Lord told me, go to Matthew 20. I look up Matthew 20, and this is how it reads. One day on one occasion, James and John, two of the disciples of Jesus, their mother came to Jesus and said, Jesus, hey, would you let my son, uh, this son and this son, maybe when you come to the kingdom, could they sit on your right and your left? 
And Jesus looked at her, and the scripture said, he pat her on the shoulder and says, you don't even know what you're asking. Now, I never connected the two. I don't even know that John Maxwell knows the two. Like, that's what he was saying. But he tells her, you don't even know what you're asking. Are your sons willing to drink the cup, the cup of suffering, the cup of, of obedience, the cup of death, where they were gonna die for him? And they said, yes, we will. And he said, yeah, you will. But as for where you sit in the kingdom, those seats are reserved for the ones the Father has prepared them for. Let me say it again. Those seats are reserved. Everybody say reserved. Listen, those seats are reserved for the ones my Father has prepared them for. And this is what the Father told me. Son, why you keep walking around like a spiritual orphan? Why are you acting like you don't have a dad? pushing and shoving and trying to make things happen. Don't you know I got a seat with your name on it? It is reserved for you. Nobody can sit in your seat. I have reserved it and I have prepared you for it and to prove it to you, where did I put you today? In a seat reserved next to John Maxwell as he tells a story about you acting foolish. Because I want you to know I can put you in any room at any time, anywhere if you trust in me. Oh, you can keep doing it your way or you can come in my way. Fifteen years after that, fifteen years, that would be this last year, this time. I'm just walking into my office, normal day, walking in on a Monday morning. As I walk in, my phone rings. There's this guy on the other end of the phone. His name's Brett. I met him six months earlier. He goes, hey, Scott, I hope you can save me. I said, what's up, Brett? He goes, I'm here in Atlanta with John Maxwell. I said, what's up with that? He said, oh, we're shooting a video tomorrow. It's the first church series that he's done in 15 years, and it's going to be a, a series on his book, Today Matters, and uh, we have a panel and this whole huge deal but there's this pastor and, uh, that was supposed to be his person on the panel with him teaching. It was going to be this guy and John and a couple other people. He bailed on us today because he has an emergency. And so we don't have like the next person to John to do the panel. And John didn't have any. So I told John doesn't know who you are, but I played a couple of videos of you and told him you're the one we want. And so he asked me to call on his behalf to invite you to see if you could fly out here tomorrow and do six hours of video teaching with John Maxwell. Wow. I was on the phone right there. I was going, hmm, when? Tomorrow? Hmm. Let me see. Hmm. <laughs> yep, I can come. <laughs> I hung up the phone and my son, who's 23, he's next to me. He is uh, on our staff and Hunter goes, what just happened? And I said, I'm going to go do this thing with John. What? You're going to speak on a panel with John Maxwell? Aren't you scared to death? I said, I don't know. I don't think so. I think it'd be good. Are you kidding? I would be freaking. Do you even know anything except for what you learned from him? I said, I think I've learned maybe one or two things. And I said, just get out of here. When he gets out, let me tell you the honest truth. I'm telling you the honest truth. Fear consumed me because I really started thinking, do I know anything except because can I tell you something? You can learn things that you've been saying for 20 years and you think you came up with it, but you got it from them. One time I wrote a song and I realized it was to the tune of Jesus loves me. <laughs> Maybe it could happen. So I started praying and I'm getting nervous. I said, God, I'm so scared. I'm so scared. This is what God said. Listen, this is what he said. Son, did you know they were doing the video? No. Did you know that they didn't have a person? No. Did you know Brett was going to call you? No. Then you didn't have any way of sending yourself. Am I the one sending you? If I sent you, then I got a seat with your name on it. It's reserved with your name and I have prepared you for it. So don't go trying to impress John Maxwell. Don't go trying to impress anybody else. You be who I called you to be and just go sit in the chair I built for you. So I get out the flight and I go there, say hi to John. We sit down and in the first session, it goes so good. Everybody goes, man, that's the best we've ever done. By the third session, he's leaning across the table going, where did you come from? <laughs> Slapping me high fives on the video. By the time the sixth session's done, he calls me over and his chief of staff and his CEO of all of his companies, Mark and Chad, and he says, come here, Scott. Puts his arm around me like this. He says, Chad. 
take a picture of me and Scott. So this is the picture that uh, we took. I know, thank you, thank you, that's cute. So he took a picture, and this is what John said as he took the picture. He said, you know what, today was a gift. And Chad and Mark goes, yeah, it was really good. He said, I'm not talking about the sessions. I'm talking about that guy not being able to come and God sending him. God sent him to me as a gift. And he turned to me, he said, you're a gift. I said, well, thank you. So then he said, you know what I believe? And I said, what? He said, I think me and you are supposed to change nations. Me and you, God put us together. I'm 71 years old and I think God just brought you into my life to extend the legacy of what I'm supposed to be doing. So we went three or four weeks after that to Costa Rica. Last week, I just got back from Nairobi. In two weeks, we go to Guatemala. All these things happening, but here's the deal. When I got on the airplane, I sat down on the flight and I'm sitting down like this. And you know what? I sit there and I go, what just happened? He just said every single thing I wanted him to say back when I was 24 sitting on the front row. And you know what God said? Of course he did. That wasn't your dream, it was mine. You just weren't ready for it yet. I look back now and I realize I was getting in rooms that I was pushing and shoving to get into that I wasn't ready for yet. I was shaking hands and exchanging phone numbers with people I thought would be strategic connections, but they weren't the connections God had prepared me for. Some of y'all frustrating the processes of God just because you don't trust that he knows how to do what he knows how to do. So when I sat on the flight, I wrote down on a piece of paper how I was when I was 20, how I was when I was 40. Check it out. In my 20s, I thought, hey, I want to be great. Now I just want to be faithful. In my 20s, I thought, man, I want to try to make things happen. In my 40s, I go, no, man, I want to make things happen. I get myself in trouble. I want God to trust him to make it happen. I thought success was being famous. Now I see it's obedience. I was losing my mind because I wanted to be great and making it happen, felt responsible for it. Now I know God's in control. So all I want to be is faithful. Now, let me tell you, let me show you what it looks like. When you go to heaven, what do you want the Lord to say to you? Well done, thy good and what? You want to hear him say faithful, not brilliant, not perfect. So why are you trying to be all that other stuff? Just be faithful. Just be faithful. Everybody say faithful. Faithful. When it's hard, when it's difficult, when ain't nothing going right, just be faithful and faithful and faithful, 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 and faithful, 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 and faithful, and faithful, 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 and faithful, and 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 faithful, 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 faithful. If you'll put faithful back to back, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, this is what will happen. This is what will happen. You'll just wake up being faithful and faithful and faithful, 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 faithful and faithful and faithful, 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 and out of nowhere, God will bring the fruitful. Everybody's wanting the fruitful without having to live the a faithful, a faithful. Faithful's my part, fruitful's his. So every morning I gotta remind myself of that. So I wake up and this is what I do first thing when I get out of bed. Okay, be honest, sometimes I have to go to the bathroom first, but other than that, this is the first thing. I stand up, put my hands in the air like I'm Rocky. Because this is the stature or position of champions in the world. I got it. And I have to confess, I don't got it. And this is what I do every morning. I don't have it. I don't have the power, the strength, the wisdom, or the authority to lead my life like you can. So I step down at the throne of my heart and I give that place to you. You are my king. I will go where you want me to go, do what you want me to do, say what you want me to say. You are my promotion, protection, and provision. I will trust in you. 
you got to remind your flesh every day. Don't trust in your own way. Trust in his. So let's close up with that. Everybody stand up. Everybody get your hands in the air like Rocky. And let's say it together. You ready? Repeat it after me. I don't have it. I don't have the power, the strength, the wisdom, or the authority to lead my life like you can. So I step down at the throne of my heart. Now open your hands. You are my king. I will go where you want me to go. Do what you want me to do. Say what you want me to say. You are my promotion. You are my protection. You are my provision. I will trust in you. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Give God praise for the ministry of Scott Wilson. Wow. Faithful, faithful, faithful. Scott, I got to know, did you tell John that story? Eventually, yeah, if, just the yeah, other day. Eventually, yeah. after a while. I think we ought to give God praise again. God can handle it. He can get you where he wants you to go. One last word, we've had an amazing revival. We're still in a season of revival. God is still working. You can hang out today and worship and pray and seek the Lord for his will in your life. I wanna thank you during the revival. You gave the largest one-time offering that I've ever received at ORU in any one chapel session to Reggie Debs and his ministry, over $10,000 Friday morning. Yeah, thank you for your generosity. God's gonna bless you guys. So here's what I want you to do as you get ready to close today. Ever, Scott, come back up here. I need your help because I'm not going to do this, but you are. Okay. okay. We're going to close by doing the faithful dance. All right. All right. So you, you well, lead us in it, okay? You, you don't need me, yeah, dog. I got it. I'm your birthday at 60. Come yeah, on. Yeah, no, no, come on. I All got right. it right here. You All ready? Right. All right. So here we go. Ready? Everybody, everybody. Ready? What we got to be? We're going to be faithful, a faithful. A faithful, 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 faithful lamb, faithful lamb, faithful, faithful, faithful. One more time. Faithful and faithful. And faithful, 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 faithful lamb, faithful lamb, faithful lamb. Fruitful. God bless you guys. Go change the world. Amen. This has been a presentation of Oral Roberts University, a world-renowned and fully accredited Christian university with more than 100 undergraduate majors and minors, as well as graduate degrees in business, education, and theology. If you or someone you know is thinking about college but not sure what to expect, then visit us for one of our fall or spring college weekends. Join us for this action-packed, fun-filled, spirit-empowered weekend and experience what it's like to be at ORU. Stay in the dorms, visit classes, attend a Golden Eagle sporting event, worship in chapel, and meet new friends. Want to advance your career or can't move to Tulsa? Then ORU has what you need with convenient online undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Don't wait. You can experience ORU's unique whole-person approach to learning and graduate empowered to succeed. Visit us today at oru.edu. Make no little plans here. My name is Johnny Crater. I'm a psychology major and I'm from Bigsby, Oklahoma. I was adopted at birth um, by two older parents. My mom today is 61 years old and my dad is 82. Um, so by all means, I grew up with grandparents. Um, a lot of wisdom abounding within my household. The talks he had with me as a seven or eight year old is what started to begin to mold me in my faith. As a fifth grader, I wanted to do something more with my life rather than just be a little kid that played sports. And so I saw this program on CNN called Where Have All the Parents Gone? And it was about the AIDS epidemic in Africa. And I had just learned that my birth dad um, was part Kenyan and this was centered in Nairobi, Kenya, and so I just felt this tug on my heart to do something for these children. I decided that I was gonna give out free lemonade and ask for donations, and I set up a lemonade stand at Walmart one Saturday with a couple of friends and ended up raising $2,000 in four hours. From there, it just blew my mind. I was like, okay, I wanna do this for the rest of my life. Like, I don't even wanna go to school. I wanna raise money and help people. It went from just building orphanages to building wells in Tanzania um, and 
ended up amassing almost $300,000 in four years. So by the time I was in eighth grade, I'd built three orphanages, I had built 40 wells, I had raised $10,000 in tsunami relief, I had done $20,000 in tornado relief, and just all over the place with whatever I felt God wanted me to do. Then I was kind of stuck. And over the past decade or so in this recession, my parents had lost a lot of money and couldn't afford to help me go to college anywhere. And I knew I was gonna have to pay for it on my own, so I was looking at the cheapest schools possible. I participated in a Quest Whole Person Scholarship event but I didn't think ORU was even a possibility for me. But lo and behold, a couple months later, I got off of work and got a call from a 918-495 number. And he said, um, I know you had talked about not being able to come to ORU for financial reasons and whatnot, but we want to let you know that we're going to help you out with that and that you're going to be a $20,000 recipient. And I, I dropped my phone. <laughs> and he was sitting there trying to like talked to me and I like was scrambling to pick up the phone but tears were like welling up in my eyes because once again like God was showing me that he loves me tremendously he loves all of us tremendously and so um, through everything I've been through everything I've walked through and seen now I get to go to the school and pursue a bachelor's in psychology and then a master's in Christian counseling and not being uh, overwhelmingly in debt and I get to have a great roommate and I get to have this great community. To people that donate towards scholarship programs, just know that if you, even if you don't see that money working physically, that there's someone like me or like anyone else that's ever received a scholarship that knows that that helps them tremendously and, and so they're not only funding a person or funding a school, that money is funding a dream, it's funding a reality and an ability for that person to go and do what God has called them to do.